All right. We have an almost full house. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to, uh, before getting into our session today, we're going to treat this as a safe space for a good conversation. Uh, and uh, we're going to do so with um, respect and with uh, regard for all speakers. Um, but we're also going to make sure that, that we have a variety and diversity of voices uh, being heard in the room. Um, this is something that um, uh, I like to say at the onset of these sessions, and I've done a, a few of these in the past, um, to make sure that we're all starting off on the, uh, on the right foot um, and from the same point of departure. So welcome to the town hall with uh, World Bank President David Malpass. Mr. President, welcome. Thank you for um, uh, your time today. I know it's a busy week. Um, but it's also a wonderful opportunity we have um, seen in the past for the World Bank and particularly the leadership of the bank to hear from those on the ground, civil society, um, those representing um, uh, millions of constituents around the world, um, both benefiting and affected by work that the bank is involved in. We're going to have the full hour, and we're going to devote uh, a good uh, majority of this hour to your questions. But let me start off with uh, a couple of uh, ground rules so that we're, we're uh, moving uh, along efficiently. Um, we we are going to, first of all, I, I also want to welcome, in addition to the audience in the in Preston Auditorium, I want to welcome uh, viewers on the live stream um, uh, from around the world. Uh, they're going to be a very important part of this discussion. And so um, I invite those who are not in the room, or even those who are in the room who would like to ask a question, but particularly to have your question or your um, idea or concern on the public record to use social media, um, and you, you'll see the hashtag up there at um, AMCSO19, AMCSO19. Uh, send your questions in, and the World Bank Civil Society team is monitoring social media, and they will um, uh, give us the questions and, and um, uh, notes uh, to echo in the room. Um, in addition, we have three microphones around the room. And um, we're going to structure our conversation after uh, a few welcoming remarks um, into three, possibly four, uh, broad themes of questions. We're going to talk about the broad theme of human capital, uh, the dire issue of climate change, um, and uh, we'll definitely touch on uh, transparency, accountability, civil society closing space, and time permitting, we will also touch on uh, uh, concerns that we heard earlier today at the uh, uh, preparation lunch uh, meeting with civil society on issues of migration and conflict. Um, so we will organize our, our questions in that, in that manner. Uh, but if you do have questions already, uh, please do send them on social media and we'll make sure that they're, they're being aggregated for, for response. I will ask, as a civil society activist myself, I will ask that we not use this forum to um, read or distribute petitions or statements, because that will take away from the time that we have to actually have a conversation. It is by no means a, um, uh, a dismissal of the veracity of your cause, um, of, the, of the statement that you would want to read, but I would simply ask that we respect each other and sim uh, really focus on asking questions during the session rather than um, uh, taking up the time to read statements. If you do have statements, I will stay here afterwards and take them and make sure that um, David receives them afterwards, absolutely. Um, Without further ado, um, thank you for your time. Uh, this is your first uh, town hall, so welcome. Thank you, Alex. Um, it, you know, at the spring meeting, we had uh, some interaction as well, and I've done quite a few, uh, two and, uh, town halls here at the World Bank with staff. With staff. So we've had a lot of interesting questions, and I'm looking forward to it. And Wonderful. thank you for the work you do and uh, to people in the group as, as well. Our pleasure. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your key priorities and, and where you see civil society playing a role. 
the standard answer, of course, is the mission. So, and that, and I, I think that's a relevant starting point. Extreme poverty is still high, mm -hmm. and one worry I have is that it could go higher in some countries. Uh, that's because global growth is slowing down, and also because certain parts of the world have especially intractable problems, maybe of uh, refugees, immigrants, of, uh, of, of climate effects, of, uh, um, and of governance uh, kinds of challenges. So that's one. And then shared prosperity. If, if we get to the core of it, I would like to see people having a better living standard. Mm -hmm. And that's broadly construed. That means more s disposable income, but uh, equally important, uh, uh, a society where they feel safe. Uh, and security is a big issue worldwide, especially for women, but it affects everyone, and, and especially for girls. Um, uh, those are important and hard issues. And so if we think of living standards, I'll use that term maybe some today as a broad concept that mm -hmm. includes the environment, it includes global public goods, it includes whether you have freedom within your society, all of those things are really important. So the question is, what do you want to do? Well, the mission is clear enough, and to get there is harder than, I mean, it is faces these very real challenges. I'm not sure we're making, or I, I'll say it the other way, we aren't making nearly enough progress on those, mm -hmm. on that mission. Uh, David, w w given that we have an audience of um, real thinkers and doers on the ground, right? These are the folks who, who uh, touch lives and, and talk to folks um, on the ground in communities. Um, if, if there were a couple of headlines for this group um, in terms of your priorities and the, the bank's mission, where would you say you would like to have that conversation? I, I'm not sure I can limit to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, two or, th or three. Mm -hmm. So interact with the, w with the World Bank mm -hmm. on the ground, uh, with the countries themselves. But the challenges I, it, are are so different in different countries. Some countries have dual exchange rates, which really is difficult to overcome. It's hard for people to, for poor people to interact with that environment because the benefits are always going to whoever gets the special exchange rate. But I, then there's agricultural problems where the government may want you to buy only the fertilizer that they sell, or they may tell you and uh, subsidize certain things that you do. I was in Madagascar in uh, April, and the, you know they already make a lot of rice. Children are facing stunting because they don't have the right nutrients. Mm -hmm. But there's not really a method to move from broaden the crop base from rice into into other things. So the World Bank's trying to help with that, but that takes a lot of work. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of other mm -hmm. things. Rule of law, and that often, that means a fairness within the system that uh, allows people to uh, actually have opportunity. Uh, and it's very, it seems very hard to do. And I, I do want to mention uh, digital money. It's kind of mm. a nerdy thing, <laughs> except what we see is that even when someone is very poor, if they have the ability to transact, then they begin to find things where they can add value. Where something is worth more to the other person, they, they have something to sell and they have something they want to get. And so, but with the way the money system works now in most of the world, it's too expensive to make that exchange. So people fall back on barter which we know is really an inefficient system. So I'm, I, I talked at McGill uh, last week about how do, you, how do you create a system where there can be low cost transactions. Mm -hmm. And that also from a, from a money, from a, um, from a development standpoint, remittances mm -hmm. become a very real possibility if you get the cost of transactions down. There are people living often outside their home country that have a job, and, but they 
can't send money back now because the obstacles are too high. <laughs> so if we could break through that problem, I think it would help quite a bit with the poverty, with, with, uh, with extreme poverty. So Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think that, that sets us up, teases us up nicely for questions. Um, uh, let's open it up for questions. Um, for the first theme, um, I'd like to suggest that we um, have questions, and I would invite you to um, uh, get to the mics if, you're, if you do have questions, um, around human capital. And, and at the lunch prep, we, we talked a little bit about what that encompasses. So I'm going to try to. Um, uh, capture uh, the full theme. Uh, what we're talking about here is um, everything that touches the lives of the human beings that are uh, affected by the programming that, that occurs, by the challenges that we see on the ground. Nutrition, jobs, education, uh, social um, uh, safety, um, inclusion. And under inclusion, we want to make sure that we, we think broadly. Um, um, uh, disenfranchised communities, such as the disabled uh, uh, people with disabilities, uh, LGBTQI, uh, women, youth, um, indigenous uh, people and their plight. Um, so really, anything that touches on uh, the, the ability, the capacity of human beings to uh, uh, live a dignified and prosperous life, this is the time to ask uh, questions. Um, I would like to suggest that we take about three or four questions um, at once, um, answer them, and move forward. Yeah. So why don't we start here? Thank you, Dennis Nazaroff, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, just like uh, President Malpas to briefly um, I'll talk about the issue of a middle income trap. Um, so if we talk about human capital in countries like Vietnam, for example, and Jamaica, where a country becomes, quote unquote, not poor middle income based on the World Bank qualifications, at the moment where people in that country need help to develop uh, human capital and, and to build their economies, they lose assistance. Uh, many times they have to pay more for pharmaceuticals and essentially they're expected to take on more and more of the responsibilities of development from their own uh, budget and that really undermines uh, their Thank development. You. Thank you for your question. Let's go over here. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Abdullah Abdurrahim from Initiative for Sound Education, Relationship and Health, Nigeria. Um, I want to ask what the World Bank and the IMF could do in the area of the reactions that follow the data they read out in terms of unemployment and poverty rate in Africa. Because this has been one of the reasons why a lot of African young people go to the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean Sea to cross over because they want a better life. And uh, I, I want to quickly make this suggestion. If we could have a situation whereby the data of a particular country is compared to the past data to see how the government is actually making an effort rather than comparing that country to the larger uh, company that I can call heavyweight countries. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you very much. Let's go over here. My name is Zakaria Suleimana. I work with Oxfam, and I'm based in Accra, Ghana. Um, my submission is on education. Um, over the last two decades, we have witnessed considerable progress in education. But the fact is that many governments are struggling to find the adequate financing to ensure that a public education is inclusive and is of quality. And the fact also is that uh, many governments are choosing to go the route of for-profit commercial education. And they see it as the fastest route to ensure that education is extended to everybody. But our greatest concern comes from the fact also that the bank is actively supporting uh, this commercial for-profit education. The evidence on the ground shows emphatically that Commercial for profit education or low fee private education leads to significant exclusion and inequality. The question, can we get to the question, please? Okay. Um, it is uh, a request. Mm -hmm. And the request I am making is on behalf of 173 organizations 
from 63 countries around the globe to the World Bank to take a principled stand in support of uh, public quality education, especially in low-income and middle-income uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we'll need to go to the next question. Yeah. I, I appreciate your time, but in order to get to all the questions, we'll need to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, can we go over here? Please? Sure. I'm Angela Pashayan. Thank you for being here, Mr. Malpas and Mr. Sadar. Uh, I'm from YOD International, um, and I may not look like it, but I actually work in the slums of Kenya. Um, the, the slum that I love the most is Mukuru, and I've been working there since 2012. So I've been in contact a little bit with World Bank in Kenya, but there's a disconnect. There are things that the slum residents, and this is 865,000 that's in Mukuru, that they want to do to help themselves. And they're beginning to do them. We've started programs for them to do very small, simple things to help themselves. But when I look at the data for programs called KISIP, K-I-S-I-P, and it has something to do with informal settlements, which is basically people who live in the slums, the money doesn't get to them. It doesn't get to them. And so I've met once with World Bank in Kenya. And you know, it's kind of a hands-off thing. Like we give the money to you know, whoever's in charge of that region, and then whoever's in charge of that region does what they want to do. And so I've offered, you know, let me work in partnership and, and try and help you. Because these people, they don't want your money. They don't even want to move from the slums. They want to stay in the slums. But they want it to be a little bit better. And we have active programs that actually work in agriculture and in art. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out how to make it work. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to suggest we, we uh, remember this question probably for the third theme uh, in terms of effectiveness with work with um, country offices, but um, uh, point taken on this. Let's go here and then over here, um, and then we'll end this section and then we'll answer the question. Sir? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Lamborghini. I'm a musician and a global prison ambassador. I am here today to speak about and ask questions on prison reform across Africa. How can the World Bank help influence country policies to ensure that men and women who are incarcerated have access to basic education? And also, how can the World Bank from, uh, from the country level also ensure that within the workforce that there is job opportunities for returnees who are coming back from prisons to be able to reintegrate properly back into the society. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. Hi, I'm Nazir Sinoni. I'm with Bank Information Center Europe based in Amsterdam. And uh, I have actually two quick questions uh, to President Malpas, both of them related to the LGBTI issues. The first one is, that. We haven't heard a lot about you know, where Mr. Malpa stands vis-a-vis -vis LGBTI issues in the public. I'm sure he has spoken elsewhere, but uh, I would be very interested to hear you know, how he plans to work with the team here to basically ensure that the LGBTI community benefits from the World Bank's prosperity, linking back to you know, the shared prosperity question and you know, objective of the World Bank. And the second one is, as you know, President Kim has been quite a champion on the LGBTI issues and talking about those issues within the bank. Uh, before leaving the bank. And just before leaving, he also made a big promise to the community that the World Bank would invest $750,000 uh, within the institution so that they could produce three case studies in different parts of the world that would look at the cost of homophobia. So my question is quite direct if he's going to retake that you know, promise from Dr. Kim and work with the team to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, can we main, keep the question for the next section? And, and yeah, um, you'll wait. be the first one. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, thank you, everybody. Those are all uh, very good, good points, interesting points. Um, I, I, and I'll, I'll try to answer um, most of them. Um, the uh, uh, middle income trap, uh, I think, is real, meaning, or, and it was probably well described that as countries do better than you take away, you, you know, we, we have in IBRD, we want countries to graduate and move beyond world, the World Bank or use technical assistance more than they do loans. Um, 
but my, so my one observation on that is um, what we've seen in other countries is if the, if the country keeps going on the path that it's been going on, my view is that they can plow through that. So I would say, or my own opinion, and I haven't studied this a lot, is what we're calling the middle income trap is the country gets to a spot and then it stops doing the things that will take it to the next uh, uh, level. Um, and so, um, so, so I know that's not a full answer, but that would be my thought that there, I think the data shows pretty much that countries on the right path in terms of either median income growth or GDP growth rates or that that the, 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 when they reach what's called the trap, it's often a leader has stayed in office too long, you know, which happens, or a succession process occurs where they don't have as strong a leadership. Um, so, at, well, and one other, as a technical matter, middle income can be, can be met. There's so many different financial products out, meaning as the country moves above uh, World Bank uh, levels, IFC is very involved. The private sectors of the countries begin to take over. There's money from private sources, and usually the country is um, moving to try to take that, uh, to take advantage of that. The N N Nigeria question about unemployment, I, this is, in a way, it's a similar question that we've got such, po such uh, population growth, wh what's going to happen? Um, and uh, so the World Bank is studying that, and that's a primary subject of the Development Committee uh, meetings that will occur on Friday is uh, jobs and economic transformation, JET. There's a report out on that. It's the thought process of how to keep creating jobs. And the question was about what, what, does, the data, what does the data show? And I think it shows I, well, I shouldn't say what I think it shows. Um, w we should look at that, uh, but um, one observation is small and medium-sized enterprises and some freedom and liberal uh, aspect of the trade that comes into a country, the trade that goes out, the trade among cities and we, in Nigeria, m different regions of the country trading with each other uh, and with neighbors. I, w I was just on a panel with uh, the minister from Niger who was saying their, one of their biggest challenges is how do we get to trade with Nigeria? So, and that, that becomes important. Uh, and immigration, of course, is, so, I mean, the preferred solution for everybody in, in the world is that it's, that people want to stay in their, in their homes and make them really a, vi a vibrant environment. That's what we're working on through the cities program, through gender, uh, uh, gender um, empowerment uh, programs through quality of life. I'll come back to LGBTQI uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in that answer. Oxfam uh, uh, made, the, made the case for education, for quality of education, for principled public education, and we agree with that. We have a lot of data on that of uh, showing how uh, education systems are maybe are not meeting the learning needs of people. We're going to have an indicator tomorrow, or a, there's a whole conference tomorrow that uh, Annette Dixon will uh, chair and I'll participate in on. We're, we're launching a learning poverty um, concept or indicator with, based on a lot of data showing that uh, describing pretty clearly the importance of literacy, especially for girls, but it's true of everyone at age 10. If you are not there, it's very hard as you get older to become literate if you haven't g gained some um, some basic skills by age 10, and the data is disappointing in that regard. And it, it, it in different countries, it's, it points to different uh, solutions. So for some countries, it may be 
you know, spending on education isn't enough. But in other countries, it looks as if there's a lot of spending going on on education, but there's absenteeism of teachers. Uh, or, and in other countries, there's not the materials. The kids can't get to school. One big problem that we work on that is uh, horrible is if kids, uh, if there's too much violence for them to get to school. So it's absenteeism on the part of the student. And so we're, we are working actively on that with not enough gains. Uh, I mean, that's an unacceptable situation if, for to have a uh, situation where the child lives pretty close to school, can't get to school because of, uh, of incidents of violence on the way. Um, uh, and um, oh, and I I don't know this program T, uh, K K S I P in K K I S I P in Kenya, and I will look into that. Uh, but I want to make the general point: um, Ken, Kenya has this a system where there's actual low-cost transactions to to very poor people. 80% of the adults in Kenya have uh, cell phones. They're basic cell phones, but they accept money. And so if if there are situations where, and I, I need to look into the one um, that you describe in Nairobi. I know, I, and let me make, so that's one point is the importance of low cost transactions, digital, that reach even the poorest people within a society, I think are highly empowering. And the data shows they empower women the most because they're the ones excluded from a cash society. Um, so that point, but I also wanted to mention the importance of cities. Um, the, the World Bank has a big cities program, it's vital, and the reason for that there used to be a thought in development that if you had the rural areas work function well enough, then people would stay and be farmers. Uh, I, I've drastically oversimplified that. And in some cases, that's going to be a good outcome. But the reality of young people is they want to move to the cities. Um, and so the, the planning of the cities is important. The, the layout, the road layout, uh, the street layout, and the protection of the, of the property rights in, in, in streets is important. Nairobi has, a, I think, a real problem with transit and with people being able to get to a job. Uh, those are all parts of the city's program that we are active in. And I think it's an area that needs a lot of uh, new new work because the cities are growing so fast. I mentioned uh, Niger, so uh, Ouagadougou I think has a million and a half people. Um, so this is giant, right? And it's growing every day. And so how do you have enough services to really um, make that work? Okay. So I think I think I got most of this. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Lem, Mr. Lamborghini uh, mentioned uh, prison reform. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. T t I would tend to classify that into we want rule of law. We want countries that have tolerance for people of all of all uh, backgrounds, mm -hmm. persuasions, um, and uh, th th and respect for basic human rights. Um, it, so. I don't know enough about how to uh, how to really improve that situation. So I appreciate the input on that. As far as LGBT, I um, I've spoken to our group here at the World Bank. Again, I'll fall back to tolerance is critical of all different kinds of, uh, or I mean, all different parts of the human race. And that may be religious intolerance, that may be, and, and I think we need to uh, continue putting uh, a strong stance uh, when those principles are violated, which the bank does try to do. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, that, that we are, we're pretty diligent in trying to uh, speak out as a bank when those principles are violated. 
And, and David, one, the, there was one oh, question case about study. the three case studies. I, I, don't, I need to look into that. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. And there is one question that came from the live stream. Uh, Frank, oh man, uh, Orgy, I think, Orgy, uh, from Nigeria. How can the World Bank help in providing free primary care and universal health coverage in Africa? Uh, so we, you, you, we have a lot of active programs aimed at that. Um, and so, or aimed at, aimed at getting good outcomes. So the goal is to have good health outcomes. So for, for example, you may want to start as far as free health care services with, uh, uh, with services related to children, related to nutrition, you know, the most important interventions and some kind of prioritization of, uh, of all the different basic health care needs that are the highest priority, um, and then have a, uh, a demonstrated way for either for governments to provide that, meaning a, an actual functioning system where the vaccination occurs and is is kept track of, or the treatment for tuberculosis is followed up enough that it actually gets done. We, the, the bank has a big set of programs on early childhood intervention and nutritional intervention. Those are documentable problems mm -hmm. uh, that occur much more frequently than they should that end up with, let, with stunting or with bad health and then the costs are astronomical as the child gets older and older. So um, the, the way we do that is well-designed programs country by country. Um, I don't know how many we have, but it would be hundreds that are active on, in that area. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you for the great questions. Um, let's move on to the next category of climate change, climate crisis, and um, contingent issues. Um, I think uh, I've heard uh, energy inf investments, uh, environmental, environmental safeguards, and so on. Um, so let's start with um, over here and then move forward. Thank you. My name is Alana Kembabazi with the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights in Uganda. Uh, Mr. Malpas, you mentioned that extreme poverty is on the rise. Um, and we know that we're seeing the World Bank increasingly invest, when we talk about healthcare, increasingly invest uh, or push for the private sector to come in to play a role through public-private partnerships and through other arrangements. Now, ISA's research on the ground and it's echoed in a number of other countries like the Latin American context has found that the poor are often excluded. They don't participate in these projects and they just it results in an affordability, high fees, um, and, and, and just really weakens the public health system in a lot of ways because the government focuses on sort of the private sector rather than focusing on a resilient public health system. Why not invest in a resilient public health system? We know that it's often the first point of call for the poor and vulnerable. And to what extent do you ensure that their participation is safeguarded uh, when you come up with projects like public, public private partnerships that supposedly seek to meet their needs? Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go over here and then we'll go over here. Thank um, you very much. Uh, I'm speaking for the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance and the West African Alcohol Policy Alliance. Yes, uh, in the year 2000, the World Bank, uh, in collaboration with the Health o World Health Organization, actually uh, acknowledged, accepted the facts, especially the evidence that al the alcohol is very harmful. And as such, the World Bank actually issued a statement, a note to that on alcoholic beverages. So the question is, we want to know, uh, will the World Bank report on any existing loan to increase alcohol production currently? Then secondly, health taxes are increasingly acknowledged as a sustainable way for low and middle income countries to raise resources to support the health sector. So we want to know, is the World Bank going to support, what measures are going to put in place to support low and middle income countries to raise resources to address issues including alcohol? Great. Thank you very much. Please. Hello, my name is Livy. I'm from the Institute of Socioeconomic Studies in Brazil. And my question is very simple. How come the World Bank, and most importantly, perhaps the IFC, is still funding fossil fuels? 
Thank you. Let's go here. Hi, President Malpass. I'm here with Sustain Us. We are um, a U.S. youth group advocating for global justice and sustainability. Um, we are here in solidarity with the six million young people who went on strike last month. Um, out of concern for the climate crisis and our futures. The World Bank's own website statistics state that climate change will lead to 143 million new climate migrants, 100 million new people pushed into poverty, and $1 trillion of private sector loss. The IPCC tells us in order to avoid these terrifying impacts, we must stay at or below 1.5 degrees of warming, and our generation feels real fear that we are on track to quickly surpass this target. I understand that it's difficult, but do you believe that the, Wor the World Bank's current investments, especially their continued investments in oil and gas, are, on, are going to lead us below 1.5? Great. Thank, Thank you it. very much. Let's go here. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Malpas. Thanks for joining us today. My question is, how is the World Bank seeing some of the challenges related to what's called sustainable infrastructure or even the idea of a Green New Deal, something that's being discussed a lot in the United States, is a way to simultaneously address various crises that we're dealing with today. So first of all, the issue of inequality, improving people's living st standards and quality of life, addressing the climate crisis, including through the Paris Agreement and beyond, and within a framework of sustainable development, including the sustainable development goals of the UN. Uh, the big question seems to me how to do that. I think there seems to be consensus about the importance, but the bigger question is how to do that, and particularly how to avoid mistakes of the past. In that regard, I'd like to hear some of your ideas with regard to some of the key issues that we've seen in relation to, to infrastructure projects in the past. For example, related to the human rights of affected populations, their territorial rights, right to free, prior, and informed consent, problems of projects that have underestimated social, economic, and environmental risks, um, looking at other, the need for more comprehensive sector analysis in the energy and the transportation sector, transparency, corruption, including within the PPPs, the private public-private partnerships, and then in, within that context, to avoid false solutions and repetition of mistakes in the past. And just to, to talk about an issue my organization has worked with to finish, uh, in terms we, of hydroelectric dams, which are often framed as green energy, but which have all, often been extremely problematic. Unfortunately, we even had a session planned with the bank to discuss, is there such a thing as sustainable hydropower? How would it be done? And the bank didn't indicate a, a representative, and we had to cancel the session. So yeah, I'd like Great. to hear Thank about you. that. Thank you very much. Let's go over here. Thank you. I am Richard Jordan, representing the Blue Community Consortium uh, at UN headquarters in New York. And I'm the dean of NGO representatives there, serving 40 years on a daily basis. Uh, President Malpas, I would like to extend an invitation to you to be the first World Bank president to come to the United Nations headquarters and to engage in a civil society town hall just like this one with uh, NGOs, CSOs, and youth, and that the logical time that this might occur would be in uh, the week following the World Bank Youth Summit here December 2nd and 3rd. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in New York. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to the point. <laughs> We can start. Yeah. Okay, well, to that, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I will look at the look at, look at the calendar, and I appreciate the uh, the invite and the and the thought. Uh, and I was in uh, New York uh, last week or the week before for the NG, uh, for the for the uh, UN General Assembly, and there was a uh, extended discussion of uh, of climate. At that, and so, but I, I, I take the context also of, uh, of this uh, uh, town hall idea. Um, okay, so uh, let me describe a little bit what the World Bank's doing, and then relate it to the questions that I heard. So the 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 bank is uh, very is deeply engaged in climate and the environment uh, and and so what it's the it's the biggest funder worldwide of climate and environment uh, 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 projects and and activities um, in 
in, for example, among the international organizations that includes the UN and all the, the others and, and the multilateral development banks, the World Bank alone is nearly half of the, of, of, of the entirety. Um, and th that in, in a year ago, we increased, uh, we doubled our commitment on, uh, uh, on climate action um, to $200 billion over the, over the fiscal uh, 2021 through 2025, um, which is, is a big commitment by global standards. Um, uh, and we, in addition, one of the things that the bank has done that's relevant, I think, to the questions is uh, implemented um, safeguards that are, by and large, have been very effective. So we have a, a big overhead cost within the bank of watching and evaluating projects and then trying to learn from mistakes. Uh, there's an inspection panel and in, internal uh, evaluation group uh, that uh, and and a, uh, uh, a, 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 a and and other functions that get at and try to and so so the IFC has a very active uh, um, uh, uh, CAO function, which which uh, looks at problems in their in the projects that they work on, which are often which are private sector uh, projects. Um, the bad news is there are cases that come out of this process where mistakes have been made. Uh, the good news is there aren't that many. Uh, and when they are found, there's, there's a pretty well prescribed uh, dispute resolution process uh, that, uh, that I'm engaged in, senior management of the bank is engaged in, junior management of the bank is engaged in. Um, so, and so I think it's a, uh, a system that's working pretty well but never fully satisfying uh, all of the interests of all of the stakeholders. One of the things to keep in mind is the cost of it is, is large. So as we were talking about Nairobi, uh, it's, it, Nairobi, Kenya has a, 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 a need for transportation corridors. It's very hard within the system uh, to, to uh, be engaged because their, their own internal Kenyan uh, dispute or displacement function is so expensive that uh, that it's that it um, m makes it hard to hard to have uh, rational develop or or uh, um, development processes that meet the needs of the people in the in the uh, in the various parts of Greater Nairobi. Um, okay, so with regard to then the. Um, well, the, the first question was on extreme poverty, Uganda, affordability, resilient public health. And so uh, I would say just to that, we look at different models and use the models that really work within the country. And we, we try to be very engaged with the country and listen to what model they think will work. And then we, uh, we can obviously want to add value on if the country's on a really wrong track as far as what their model is for providing public uh, health services. And I earlier mentioned the importance of, for example, early intervention in childhood uh, uh, health and nutrition. Um, there was the question, the issue on, uh, it was West Africa related, but the issue of uh, does the World Bank support production of alcohol? Uh, and could there be health taxes? I think those, that's a very practical question. I don't know the answer as far as whether IFC uh, would be involved. Uh, well, I, I think they probably are in beer companies on occasion, and that would be something that, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I would like to discuss and hear people's uh, views on that. With regard to health taxes as a way to fund support, um, I, you know, the, 
I, I want the World Bank to be open to different financing mechanisms that really work for, for countries. And we should recognize the range of diversity um, in terms of what, like t what type of tax works in one country might not work in another country. So I, I, don't know the, I'm, I don't know the answer on various types of health taxes. Um, as f I, I do want to make a point with regard to fossil fuels that the, the bank is, does not fund coal projects. One of the issues the world is facing is the continued use of uh, uh, and building of coal in, uh, in China, in India, uh, even in Europe. Uh, and uh, w the, that one, one of the issues for groups to, uh, to consider. But the World Bank's not engaged in that. Um, uh, uh, there was uh, the, the straightforward question of, is there enough investment being done to keep the temperature from going up by uh, by a degree and a half or by two two degrees. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not a scientist. I I described the the commitments the bank is making and is actively implementing the various um, uh, climate and environment uh, activities. I was in I was in uh, Mozambique um, in 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 April and saw the positive effect from uh, from uh, some some from the resilience activities. Mm -hmm. So one of the things uh, the bank is doing, and it costs a lot of money, but it has a positive payoff. We think is uh, is recognizing the. Benefit from being from preparation and from building materials, from good design, uh, from drainage systems uh, that are that uh, benefit and are well designed for the needs of uh, different parts of the world. Recognizing that cities are often being built or are growing right on coastlines, sometimes in floodplains, uh, and that creates uh, uh, big big challenges. Um, and so we do try, one of the questions was on sustainable infrastructure. So that's, of course, a mainstream big activity of the, of the bank to try to have various sustainable ways to have infrastructure operate. And that may be in the, from the standpoint of electric vehicles. That may be from the standpoint of, uh, of people, of efficient modes of transportation to work. One of the one of the biggest challenges for for impoverished countries is there may be jobs, but there there's no way for the person to get to the job, and they don't have the the means. Their family can't move to the job. That's not practical. So they're traveling an hour and a half in an old bus to get to a job, and so that's that's having a big uh, environmental impact, a big climate uh, uh, a concern. And so we're, we uh, are trying to address that directly in lots of programs around, around the world. That may involve uh, design of the bus system. Uh, it may be, uh, uh, in some cases, rail systems that, uh, that are a, a positive substitute. Recognizing again, and I'll come back to the early point that I made, uh, the A goal is to have people's living standards in very broad terms actually go up. And that problem is a, uh, is a, is a big challenge for human beings, I think, worldwide, because the risk is that we've got, that there are living standards in quite a few in too many parts of the world that are going down, either because pollution is, is uh, rising, because they live near, the, near the, 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 the ocean, because they have violence on the way to work, all of the different, uh, I mean, and I could go, I mean, there are 30 other things that ought to be on that list that are challenges that aren't being met effectively. So, uh, you know, I, uh, one of the things I've 
tried to do in my job is instill and bring a sense of urgency to this that there, you know, the numbers are staggering as far as the population growth relative to the, whichever, well, relative to job growth, relative to health care, um, ability to provide health care relative to nutrition or foodstuffs. And it's going on, we're talking about year by year, a uh, major new problem surfacing in that regard. Great. Um, Thank you, David. I, I, I do want to make sure that we, um, taking a cue from you in terms of urgency, that um, <laughs> sorry, uh, no, it just that there is a there there is a sense of urgency around climate and and the questions that we heard, and it's good to hear about the the banks um, um, sort of early efforts in, in this area, and and we're only going to look for the bank to be a leader in this in, in driving um, policies and and certainly uh, the right investments um, in this area. Um, did you want to add something to? No, no, no I, I was. Apologizing for not being urgent in my no, no. answers. You're, you're fine. You're fine. But I, I just want to sustain us and, and um, the question from our colleague from Brazil. I think were important uh, reminders that there is, you know, it's, it's yeah, there's urgency. Um, we are running low on time, so if I may use um, uh, the moderator's prerogative, there was a question uh, that was proposed uh, by a colleague at the lunch prep um, that I'd like to uh, pose um, as a closing question, and I do apologize that we didn't get a chance to cover all three themes, but this last um, question is about that theme, and I want to tie it into the, to the question from our colleague from Kenya um, uh, about effectiveness. I think, I think the, the uh, uh, thematic issue of um, support and, and empowerment of uh, people living in the slums. I think that's a that's a, that's very much a. a, 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 a a conversation to be had, but I think that the larger theme around this is how do, how does civil society uh, work better, more effectively with um, bank offices and bank teams uh, at the country level, and and what are some of the um, 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 sort of directives and 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 uh, changes in direction that we may expect to see. But I want to tie that in with a question from a colleague from the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. A group like this could not get together in many countries um, in the MENA region, right? Um, if, if civil society did get together um, uh, to ask a question, to have a conversation, we would probably be uh, um, under threat. Um, and so shrinking space, if we talked about shrinking space about you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, it is not closed space because of extremism, because of political uh, autocrats, and because of um, all sorts of issues. Um, the bank is a, is a major um, stakeholder in opening up space uh, in, in many ways. Um, uh, what, what are your ideas? What are some of the thoughts that you have in that, in that area uh, in terms of helping civil society be at the forefront of this work? Um, thanks. I have several. One is uh, uh, it, with regard to the shrinking and closed space to, to that uh, the bank pushed back strongly on that. And yeah, we do that. And one of the things I've been, I, I want to do and am doing is to have our programs be uh, uh, a lot of the energy has to be in the countries themselves. So that means the country directors and the country managers and analysts in countries need to have opinions on shrinking space and then ways to push back. That might be an op-ed in the country. Uh, that might be drawing boundaries with ministers that are, that are uh, not, mm -hmm. not uh, properly engaged in topics. And the bank is, that I've mentioned that with the LGBTQ uh, um, uh, discussion of uh, uh, the bank trying to push back where we hear of problems. So that gets into this big, broad issue of rule of law. We have the Women, Business, and the Law Report, which is intended to uh, focus on some of the issues in particular related to women, but in a way they're broadly about the um, uh, you know ability of people to live in their country. You, you know, one of the problems in the MENA region is girls 
there may not be a birth certificate or they may not be documented. My sense is that in some of the countries in the region, there's progress being made. And so one of the th things that we can do is uh, publicize that progress. Um, and so that means in a country that has uh, allowed women to have driver's licenses or to have passports, uh, publicize that a bit with, uh, within our reports and say, good, there needs to be so much more uh, done and allowed. Um, recognizing that you know the countries are going at different, dramatically different paces, that's my impression. I don't want to, I, I, I kind of keep track of which ones are moving forward and which aren't. And we do, in private meetings, push them. And I, our country directors are engaged in that as well. Um, and it shows up in our reports. You know, one of the ways we can do it is to have these uh, reports that I'm, I'm not big into rankings because everyone is so different. But it turns out to be pretty effective to really have rankings and countries see it. They go to international meetings and they are kind of confronted with the reality that their country ranks really low on uh, on, on uh, g gender issues, let's say, or on other things. So I think, um, and then so as far as um, change, the the it's not really a. I don't want to describe it as a change of direction, but what we're trying to do at the bank is have the um, programs driven uh, by deep insights into the countries themselves. And so I think that creates space for, uh, for CSO by doing that. If that's indeed the, the if, so if, you've, if, you, if you're in country, you, you shouldn't be having to talk to World Bank headquarters in order to get uh, uh, to get some kind of traction on your issues. I think it's incumbent, and I could ask the group too, to um, try to be, uh, to have a plan within your country, uh, within the countries that you're working, that is plausible, that's achievable, recognizing uh, some of the countries really don't have much capacity at all. So I, I, I'm, I'm not encouraging patience. I think there's an urgency to getting this done this year. Uh, but there is also a recognition or um, an issue that, well, we have the luxury of being in this space here and feeling somewhat safe. Uh, and other people don't. And so just putting it into that context. I'm troubled by you know, the security issues in a, a lot of countries are facing dire immediate security issues um, that, that people need to find way, that you know, we're working to try to address. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's Thank encouraging you. to hear that, that um, uh, you, are, you are pushing the bank to have more um, live and, and real-time um, country office to civil society conversations. Yes. That's key um, in a lot of the work that we're doing, and, and uh, we're looking to hear more of that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was a great conversation. Too many questions to ask, and, and we still want to continue. But please keep sending your questions in to the, to the hashtags, and, and they'll be on the public record for response. Thank you very much, and thank you, David, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.